how long have you been working with dogs and and uh, helping dogs out? I've been involved with dogs for a very long time. Like started to really get into like the whole pit bull advocacy kind of thing, like in the wake of Michael Vick and graduating from law school and all of that in like 2008 ish. I started getting involved in pit bull rescue kind of on accident because to me they'd always just been dogs. It was on the board of a couple of different pit bull rescues. And just started meeting a lot of different people locally in Arizona and then nationally. And and then after getting tired of the triage level of rescue and having been involved in some cruelty cases and things like that and having a crap ton of fosters. <laughs> and I was a pit bull nanny for a little while. I had 13 dogs at my house at one point. From a, They were from a, from a cruelty bust. Uh, create and rotate, teaching them how to be dogs, all that kind of stuff. So I ended up um, keeping two of them. Um, One of them died from all the congenital issues that happen with backyard breeding and bad husbandry and all that kind of stuff. When I got tired of the triage level of like just the constant like drama of on the ground rescue and I just couldn't take it anymore. It was so emotional. Um, I started to go more into the education piece of it, doing work. And so that's when I started. I had two, one one from the cruelty bust and then I had another pit bull. She was like a bull terrier staffy mix um, that was from death row in Maricopa County. And they both became certified therapy dogs because I figured that would be the best way to advocate just to keep them, get them out in the public and do work like that. And so that's how I got, that's my angle of the therapy dog piece of it is that we were active therapy dog teams for probably at least six years. My dogs were cross certified, not only as therapy dogs, but also as comfort dogs. We used to work for, with the, not for, but with the, the victim's office, arm of the county attorney's office, like for victim services for outreach. And we responded to a couple of like trauma scenes, like a mass shooting and stuff like that when people wanted um, dogs to respond for people to just for the comfort of that. And then we would do lots of public events. So like homicide survivors every year, suicide awareness, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So it was pretty, it was pretty cool. But we, I encountered in the process of becoming certified, you know, the kind of people in the teams that show up that want to be certified, the ones that get certified, the ones that don't, and then some that do, and then the way they behave post-certification, it's all been, it was a fascinating journey. Yeah, it sounds like it. It also sounds like you must have uh, quite a thick skin and be quite uh, emotionally together yourself to deal with all that. You know, it depends on the day, but yeah. Right. Understood. <laughs> Understood. But you're still, you're still at it though. And you know, that's good. I don't have any dogs that are therapy dogs now. Like I lost both of them about two years ago within a couple months of each other. Earl, who has his own Facebook page, he has like way more friends than I ever will have because, you know, kids loved him. In in your experience, uh, and I'm sure this is probably the same for most therapy dogs, but in, in your experience, what do you uh, look for when you're assessing a dog to do therapy work? Well, I never actually did the official assessments, but I mean, essentially, if a dog could pat... I think the underlying thing that all therapy dogs should have to pass their the CGC first, because those are all basic things that a therapy dog should be able to do and like be responsive to their handler and be able to not pick up random things and, 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 and all that. Um, but then it's more than just that because they also have to be bomb proof and not you know, have things really bother them. Like if somebody walks by with a walker and a cane or somebody sets off firecrackers near them or pops balloons and they don't freak out or anything, or they don't decide like, I don't really like that dog. Those are things that, you know, I observed sometimes with some of the the teams because I think the majority of people that try to get their dog certified, and I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, are like little old ladies that have little dogs that just want to be able to go out in public and do stuff with them and do nice things like go to hospitals and visit with people and things like that. And sometimes those dogs really shouldn't be doing those kind of things. And then sometimes their dogs are perfect. They're so lovely. Most of the programs that certify, I think they have pretty stringent rules. And But I don't know how many different programs there are out there that are claiming to certify therapy dogs. So I can't really speak about that. Right. Yeah. Well, they should be stringent. You know, you're dealing with people Mm -hmm. with emotional issues or physical impairment, you're going to hospitals, you're nursing homes. That leads me to the the next question is, you know, a lot of people 
think their dog is going to be a great therapy dog. And while they might be, it really, as in all dog endeavors, it comes back to the person. So what would you recommend to people who, you know, think their dog is going to be a great therapy dog? What is it that they need to be able to do as a handler and a trainer for their therapy dog? I don't really think you can train a dog to be a therapy dog. I think a dog either has the temperament to be a therapy dog or it doesn't. But in know? regards to the people, like what do they have to bring to the table? Be realistic about your expectations of your dog and don't try to set your dog up to be in a situation that is not they're not going to be comfortable in like for example with my dog earl the one that came from the cruelty bus he didn't pass the first time for certification but it was because he was too timid because he just needed more confidence and so i worked with him you know getting him out more social and stuff because he because of where he came from he was just kind of the world was kind of a scary place for him and so he he blossomed and then became really good at his job. But I, I would say if you want to have your dog be considered to be a therapy dog, that you should really listen to the people that are running the program and their suggestions for either supporting your dog or maybe, maybe this isn't the right thing for your dog or maybe your dog could use a little bit more training and to not take it personally. It's not a knock on your dog. It's just not every dog is fit for every job. Yeah. And it's a very specialized environment that you're in. You know, it's not the same as if you're just bringing your dog to your friend's house or you're walking downtown, you know, it's not, right. even, it's, it's not even the same as if you're bringing your dog to Home Depot for socialization. You know, there's obviously a legal aspect to it. And you being a lawyer, you can obviously understand this, you know, you're on the, you know, insurance of the people who are giving you that certification. Exactly. Case, you know, yeah, my it, dogs, we had a, we had a million dollar policy for each dog, you know, for liability, for being able to go into different places and things like that. And so there really is kind of a high bar of the expectation of the behavior of your dog. Yeah. Um, and there should be. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I, um, I mean, I think the same thing should be ascribed, that high bar should be ascribed to people who want an emotional support dog to take on an airplane, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or that, you know, those kind of scenarios, because there's a lot going on in the world. And, you know, I've been in all kinds of situations with dogs. And whenever something's happened where my timing and mechanics, my quickness has been mm -hmm. the difference. And I get out of the situation. I'm like, wow, I'm glad this dog was with me. I have, I have said that before <laughs> too. And, 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 and the other thing I think for people that are, that are interested in having their dog be a therapy dog, remember that your dog is an animal and they have feelings and they react to different things and they have good days and bad days, just like anybody else. And that those are important things to honor about your, your animal partner as well. And like, Maybe on one day, most days that it's not going to be a problem, but maybe they're not feeling that great or something like that. And maybe you just need to say, no, we're not going to go to this event because my dog's kind of a little off and I don't want to put ourselves in a situation where number one, you would bring some kind of shade to the program because you're not a consistent team member, but also don't set your dog up for a bad experience. Yeah. And I mean, if I ever hit the lottery, I'm going to take out billboards across America mm -hmm. that simply say, don't forget dogs are animals. Because a lot of right. people, they yeah. really, you, know, you bring up a good point and I'm sure we could have a side conversation about this. <laughs> but I see it a lot, you know, uh, and I'm like, you got to remember that's an animal. They don't look mm -hmm. at the world like you do. And Sometimes I think people just, they look at dogs like they're uh, like robots, like they're like cars or appliances. And you're, you're absolutely right. They have different days. Some, sometimes they have a whole different set of behaviors and moods during one 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. You bring up a good yeah. point. I'm glad you addressed yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other thing about therapy dogs too, is like, you know, when we were really active as teams, every single event or situation or place that we would go to was different. You know, sometimes we would go to like a reading with kids event where you have somebody dressed up like in a big uh, character from a, a, a book, you know, that freaks out some dogs, <laughs> you know, yeah. it freaks out some people, you know, and so you're around a lot of little kids with some big furry that's right. reading a story, you know. <laughs> We would do one time we did the festival books, which just which was just we just sat at a booth. Um, at the end of Earl's career, what we did is we helped facilitate a bereavement group for little kids twice a month, um, and that was really his wheelhouse for sure because he was the this was his strength is that he wasn't like outgoing and didn't get in people's faces. He let 
little kids especially come to him. And so I'd always just warn people, if you get in the splash zone, he's going to make out with you, but it's up to you how close you want to get to him. He's not going to come bug you. And so, Mm -hmm. um, but he was really good at that and also identifying what kid was the saddest that day. And then he would just go sit next to them. Mm -hmm. So dogs are pretty magic if you let them be. Dogs are completely magic all the time. (laughs) They really are. Um, I often say that dogs were given to humans to teach us empathy and understanding and patience and all that stuff. Do you ever do any work in prisons with dogs to help prisoners? Is there an interest in that? And and I'm, I'm totally interested in that. And I'm such a huge fan of that program that's in California. I think it's Zach Scow that's doing that, but that positive change program in California is just outstanding. And it's beginning to be implemented here in Arizona at the women's prison, I think. But other than that, I don't know that much information about it. I would love to be involved in something like that. Yeah. I mean, it would seem like it would be a great way to help uh, people in prison connect with something and take the mind off of what they're Oh, yeah. In Pima County, they did. There's been a couple of times where Arizona Department of Corrections has sent people um, like that are low risk, not going to be there forever, to be able to go work at some of the open intake shelters that are county run. Invaluable to the guys and to the dogs. The fact that they can get out of the prison, get out of their heads, and connect to some other being that's not expecting anything from them. It's it's amazing. What would be your advice to people who want to get uh, into doing therapy work with their dogs? Be realistic about your dog's temperament and just be open. Like think about what it is that you, the things that you want to do and what, what's, what is the drive behind you wanting to be, be participating in that. Find a program that's got a good reputation and talk to some of the people that are already participating and maybe go to some events and just kind of see what it's like and then. Um, go from there. All right, Sarah, I'm going to let you go. I really appreciate your time. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I really do. And thanks for all you're, you're doing out there to help dogs. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you as well. All right. Mm-hmm. I'll see you on Facebook. Take care of yourself. Okay. Bye. Bye.